It's a very timely book because it deals with mortality and we've all been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. So, you know, impermanence and mortality is on our minds. I had a, a nice thing happen where in the summer issue of the Montreal Review of Books, which is a really nice tabloid devoted to our, you know, literature here in Montreal, it got just a rave, rave, rave review. And I think what happens with publicity, it really does snowball and one good thing leads to another. So you're you're lucky when that happens. I mean, I think the hardest thing for writers is just to be invisible. Yeah, I feel really fortunate about that. And I, I think the themes are, are really timely. It also deals with gender identity. There's a non-binary character uh, called Collier, who's really central. And I think the themes and the subjects are, are really important right now and speak to people. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 225 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Amy Sands Brodoff. She's the award-winning author of three novels and two story collections. Her latest novel in stories, and this is a cool concept that we get into, it's called The Sleep of Apples, centers on nine closely linked characters confronting crises related to mental illness, mortality, sooner rather than later, and gender identity. We talk about the importance of addressing such topics in fiction, Amy's experience writing short fiction and longer novella and novel-length works, and so much more. And that's coming up later in this podcast. First, let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a sub-company of Findaway. You may have heard Findaway in the news recently. Findaway was recently acquired by Spotify. What does this mean for the industry? This probably means there's going to be more power for the overall Findaway brand, which has been doing amazing work in audiobook distribution for years. And of course, the company within the company, Findaway Voices, Will uh, Degas, who is the head of that and has been on this podcast, uh, he used to actually make me do a tongue twister in the early episodes. thought that was a great idea, but I... Uh, I didn't execute it so well, so we put a stop to that thanks to many requests from listeners. But um, yeah, Findaway Voices is a very author-centric aspect of Findaway, and they have launched tools that allow authors to take control of their audiobook destiny. If you're looking for a narrator to work with, you can use Findaway Voices. There is a sort of a guided uh, process that they have with project management where you put in your request and they will narrow it down to the five to ten best narrators from their network of thousands that they think would work for you. Or, and this is a new marketplace feature that they just recently launched, where you can go and find your own narrator. Or, if you have your own audiobook file, you can just use them for distribution. And they have more than 43 retail and library networks that you can get into, and you can pick and choose. You can go to all of them, you can go to some of them. Now, the only way you can get into Chirp, which is owned by BookBub, is through Findaway Voices. And I, for one, am thrilled that in January of 2022, I have my very first Chirp BookBub. Uh, deal or trip deal. I, I call it a book pub deal because it's a big deal because getting a trip deal is a big deal. And I'm so thrilled that the first novel in my Canadian Werewolf series is going to be uh, featured in a trip deal. And I'm going to drop the price on the uh, follow ups in that series so I can take advantage of it. This was at the recommendation of the awesome person at Chirp who told me I got selected after many, many rejections. So the moral of the story here is that when you get rejected, just keep trying, keep trying and trying again. Seriously, 
the difference between failure and success is getting up one more time. Okay, that was just a little moral within an ad read. But back to the ad read and back to Find Away Voices. If you're looking to take control of your audiobook destiny and you own the rights to your audiobook or you're looking to work with a professional narrator, there are many choices and many options available for you through Find Away Voices. And if you want to explore how you can leverage them as an author, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. And now comments from recent episodes. Stanley B. Trice uh, for episode 223, uh, Love Only Better with Paulette Stout. Stanley commented on that episode over at starkreflections.ca and said, Yes, I did listen to the end of episode 222 with the balls and 223. I like how you left in the podcast about the dogs and Liz discussing her return home. It brings real life into the podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stanley. Uh, for anyone who hasn't listened to those episodes or even listened beyond uh, the end credits of the episodes, uh, I had a, a, a scene or a clip from Plain Strains and Automobiles at the very end because I talked about them, uh, that in episode 222 in relation to a book I'm publishing next year. And and then again, I thought it was kind of fun to see if people were listening. I added a little post-credit <laughs> uh, blurb uh, mention uh, at the end. And and Stanley, I'm glad you picked up on that, uh, bringing the real life into the podcast. Uh, so th this is a, a lesson, uh, again, trying a little reflective lesson, thanks to Stanley, about why that's important. Why bring real life into the podcast? Why would I, you know, leave in the fact that you can hear the dogs barking and Liz yelling at the dogs when she gets home because she knows that, you know, Thursday evening is when I'm recording the podcast. And uh, why would I do that? Why would I put in those little teasers, those little Easter eggs, those little fun bits, or uh, or even mention some of those personal things? I think it's really important, and this is this is important for your author newsletter to your fans. Now, I'm very comfortable sharing personal things, intimate personal things about my life. Liz, not so much comfortable with me doing that, but oh well, what are you going to do? She doesn't listen to the podcast. She may be the voice at the opening of the podcast and some of the end credits, but no. So um, uh, you may not be comfortable sharing some, some of those more personal things, but I think when people hear, uh, let's say, and, and, and I'll, I'll use this as an example for your author newsletter, when they see and feel and hear things that are authentic and real, it doesn't have to be details and specifics uh, of, you know, where you, you and your family went for dinner, for example. It could just be the fact that you enjoyed a great dinner out and some interesting anecdote happened to you. You don't even have to let them know where it is that you live or wherever if you're you know worried about stalkers and, and stuff like that. But when we bring real elements into those things that we put out into the world... It personifies us. When I mention that I love craft beer, there may be listeners out there that say, oh yeah, I love craft beer too. That's cool. We have something in common. Or I talk about my, my love for Monty Python movies or John Hughes films or that Die Hard is too a Christmas movie. Any of those things. Uh, I, of course, there's going to be people who disagree with me and, and don't like that. But at least I got a reaction out of you. What is it that... Um, uh, Jack Sparrow says <laughs> in reaction to you're the worst pirate I've ever heard of or, well at least you've heard of me um, it, it's it's jokingly it's it's along those lines what it is 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 made you pause made you think reminded you I'm a human and I'm real and I'm not just a voice that's kind of blathering on endlessly and going on meandering tangents and that's important uh, those those little pieces of reality, those little pieces of authenticity, I think are really important. And, and, and they may push people away. Some people may, may find them annoying and not want them. And that's fine. They don't have to. They can skip past it or whatever. But then there's going to be other people that go, wow, I get it. I appreciate that. I understand. Uh, maybe, maybe we're more alike uh, than at first uh, it seems. So thanks, Stanley, for commenting on that. If you want to leave comments for any episode of the podcast, you can leave comments over at starkreflections.ca. You can at me at Twitter. I am Mark Leslie. Or you can email me, Mark at MarkLeslie.ca. And now I'd like to welcome new patron to the podcast, 
Welcome to Jared Nelson. Jared, thank you so much for joining the team of patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash stark reflections. Thanks for joining this small but powerful crew, Jared. I did send you a note asking where uh, where to link, what website to link to for your author profile. As well, wanted to make sure you get access to the additional audio content. Just reach out to me if you're having any issues. And Jared and the other awesome patrons of this podcast, I wanted to let you know that I have just booked a time and I'm going to be sending this directly to patrons uh, later uh, today, but probably before this gets into the audio feed so you can kind of hear it before. Uh, before this goes live, is I have booked that a December hour. Uh, I'm calling it the December Stark Hangout, and it will be Wednesday, December 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern till 2 p.m. Eastern. Don't worry, I'm going to change it up. There'll be different times every month. So this one's in the middle of the afternoon, and there will be other times where they'll, it'll be in the evening because I know people are in different time zones, have different work situations, etc., uh, so this is just a chance for us to hang out and talk. You can ask me anything. Uh, we can just kind of go through uh, reflective things, maybe some things that you wanted to share. I am going to record it, and I am going to uh, use that as an episode for the podcast so that all listeners can benefit from that conversation of myself and my awesome patrons who end up coming in hanging out with me. And if you can't make it this time, don't worry, there'll be other times. So again, uh, that's just one of the perks and bonuses now that I've gotten to over a hundred dollars a month in patrons. And thank you patrons so much for your support. That really, really uh, is, speaks to my heart and says that you really enjoy what this is, uh, what what's happening here with this podcast and the episodes and the stuff that I put out. So I want to turn that around and do what I can to, to, to bring more back to this awesome community of listeners like you. But now, let's get over to my personal update. First thing I have to mention in the personal update is actually related to something Amy says, uh, maybe about 20% of the way through our interview. She mentions when she was living in New York, she mentions uh, getting to go with her, uh, a group of editors going to a lunch at the Algonquin Hotel, and I, you could probably, I'm pretty sure you hear it in my voice, I'm just so thrilled, oh my god, you got to go for an editor's lunch at the Algonquin, and I kind of fanboyed, because I have stayed at the Algonquin Hotel, I've visited the Algonquin Hotel to, you know, to have martinis and, and drinks, and it is a literary, prestigious literary hotel with a fine, fine history, which is why, in my Canadian werewolf novels, I have my main character, Michael Andrews, who is a novelist. I have him living at the Algonquin Hotel as like a long-time resident there. And the Algonquin features significantly in A Canadian Werewolf in New York, where I think the, the first scene is when he first gets home in the morning and he's having a conversation with the doorman. He also interacts with the cat, the Matilda, the cat, uh, the Algonquin Hotel cat. In Fear and Longing in Los Angeles, there is a, a moment when Matilda gets kidnapped and, and Michael has to help the cat. Now, the cat knows and recognizes his wolfish nature, so they kind of play with each other and they, you know, they play fight with each other the way animals sometimes do. But he loves Matilda. Matilda loves him, of course. Uh, and, and then, of course, the Algonquin does feature again in Fright Night's Big City coming out October, uh, October, December 21st, 2022. Because there's a lot of scenes that take place uh, back at the Algonquin Hotel. And I purposely picked the Algonquin Hotel. Uh, I visited it on my very first trip to New York City, which was in the early aughts. And I fell in love with it immediately. And almost every single time I've been back to New York, not every single time, but maybe, okay, 50% of the time I've been back to New York, I've made a point of going to the Algonquin just to go and hang out in that awesome lobby and have a wonderful cocktail and uh, and just, you know, bask in the fact that I'm, I'm hanging out with literary history. Anyways, uh, that's sort of a personal note because I just, I, I as I was listening back to, to my interview with Amy, <laughs> I freaked out when she mentioned the Algonquin. And I almost jumped. I, I did probably interrupt her uh, just, just to tell my excitement and how jealous I was that uh, she got to do that. But uh, shy of uh, personal updates and sort of related to that is I just got the gorgeous 
author copy from draft to digital print i've got that uh, in the mail it is uh, gorgeous uh, again cover design from juan pedron uh, speaking of cover designs uh, I was listed or shortlisted in the annual Kobo Writing Life Indie Cover Contest in Science Fiction and Fantasy, fantasy Categories. The cover by Juan Pedron of Fear and Longing in Los Angeles made the shortlist. And uh, voting ends on December 17th at, the, at midnight on December 17th, 2021. If you're so inclined to want to go vote, there'll be a link to that over in the show notes. But I am just thrilled. There's basically uh, six other covers in the contest. Uh, They're all gorgeous. They're all amazing. Um, I'm sure they're amazing books as well. I'm just honored to be included in the shortlist. But such a thrill to have that uh, that honor, uh, even even if I don't end up uh, winning, which is most likely because you know I only have a a one in uh, seven chance uh, of winning that. I, I'm pretty thrilled that uh, it's been recognized in that way, just as I'm about to launch the next book in the series. But that's enough babble from me. Why don't we get into the interview with Amy Sands Brodoff? Amy, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Thank you. Let's get started by talking about before your debut novel, Can You See Me, came out. What was Amy's writing life like? Well, I'm I'm kind of a late blooming writer, I would say, or or I should say, late publishing writer. I (laughs) I always knew I wanted to be a writer since I was a little girl, but it took a really long time to kind of break out. So I was working on short stories uh, for quite a lot of years and. When I was in my 20s, I, I had trouble kind of completing a story. I would start another one. <laughs> I didn't know <laughs> how to revise, really. And that's something I had to learn. So I did a lot of writing. I took workshops. I lived in the New York area. So there were wonderful workshops at, you know, the 92nd Street Y, which has literary programming. And okay the 63rd Street Y. So I took workshops. I also went to a graduate program at NYU, but that actually came later. Really? Much later. Okay. Yeah, I because I didn't have the funds or the time. So I actually, I'm, I'm remembering I did that actually after I had published a little bit. Um, so mostly I, I worked on my own and I took these, these great workshops and I did have some early success with short stories and it kind of deluded me a little bit about how hard it was going to actually be. (laughs) But um, a a story that actually became a part of my first novel, Can You See Me, was accepted in Triquarterly, which is just one of the best uh, literary magazines in the U.S. And now it's an online magazine. But when I published, it was a gorgeous, you know, 200, 300 page uh, beautifully produced print magazine and the editor Reginald Gibbons first he sent me kind of an encouraging letter and then when I revised the piece he accepted it he put it first in the journal and it was nominated for a pushcart prize so that was just wow so encouraging early on um and then you know I think writers get rejections throughout their lives I mean I certainly do <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll admit it um, but it was nice to have that some some really great things happen. Uh, the other encouraging thing, I I mostly worked freelance uh, to earn my living, and early on I had an opportunity to do freelance writing for Vogue magazine, and that was also just incredible the way that happened. I wrote them a pitch letter. And at the time, I worked for a trade medical magazine. So I had a lot of kind of health background that I'd sort of absorbed by osmosis. And I come from a very medical family. So based on the pitch letter that I wrote them, they invited me to the Algonquin Hotel for lunch. Oh, editors. Oh, my God. Hang on. I'm just just getting all (laughs) jealous about that lunch alone. I know. (laughs) I know. Uh, Because that was the place. And. 
But then they said, you know, tell us your ideas. And I gulped, you know, it's like, oh, oh, what are my ideas? Um, but it was amazing. So that, so then I got a whole bunch of work from Vogue on a freelance basis uh, to write on psychology and health. Wow. And back then, um, you could really, uh, unlike now, you could really um, earn a living doing this. Like right. you would write an article and you would really get, you know, a few thousand dollars for each article. So it was a different time. And so this, this was some of the early encouragement that I got. And then I had some harder times later on where I had to kind of, I, I guess I'd say, renew my vows and, and decide like, you know, do I want to be doing this uh, no matter what? And the answer was yes. Okay. Be- because writing it's a hard career and you know, you can go through a lot of tough times with it. So you were writing articles, like nonfiction articles, yeah. which, which was a, 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 a livable uh, career at one point for, for writers, but then also fiction, uh, trying to sell fiction to, yes. to literary journals, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if we want to get down to specifics, I kind of had an anchor job, which was um, I had started out working for this small public relations firm. And then when I went freelance, I had a deal with them where they had a commitment to give me three days of work per week for the per diem that I requested. So I knew I had that money coming in on a regular basis and then the other days I worked on my fiction or my Vogue articles or you know what other stuff I was doing so I did have that anchor job which was really helpful and you know literary magazines uh back then you know they didn't pay a lot right really ever um so you know you couldn't really make a living publishing fiction even if you were publishing a lot of it unless it was in the new yorker or Mm -hmm. harper's or um yeah so that's what i was doing and i was i was really much happier kind of working on my own um than being in a office job wow (laughs) so you had um i want to go back to this uh you know a push cart nominated story that turned into a novel how did that happen so you had the story it was published it was obviously recognized how did the how did that get adapted into your your debut novel well when i submitted the story i was already working on the novel it was material that was kind of obsessing me and uh really important to write about um in my own life my eldest brother who i was closest to growing up in childhood, we had a secret place and a private language. He, you know, very sadly developed schizophrenia in late adolescence. And it was very hard for, you know, our whole family. And I really didn't want to write a memoir. Um, I, you know, I write very limited sort of personal pieces. They're usually very short. I really wanted to write a novel because I wanted to be able to transform and I wanted to be able to get inside the character of the brother. It's a brother sister story and the sister is trying to save and help her brother as he develops schizophrenia. But what what makes it very different than say a memoir is that half the novel is written in his point of view. So that was a really, you know, amazing place to try to go like very scary, very, you know, difficult. And I think it was, you know, it alternates between their two points of view and you see kind of how his mind changes. Um, So I was already at work on the novel and when, when, but there was a sort of self-contained bit that, because, you know, that's what they would need for a literary magazine. But I was already, I worked on that novel for a long time and it's probably of all my books choose the closest to something in my life uh, more so than say more recent work. And I feel, I still feel proud of it. It was originally called love out of bounds. And I really love that title. That was the title of the story in part quarterly. And then I changed the title later on to, can you see me question mark? Okay. Now this, uh, the theme of mental illness, struggling, 
uh, with mental illness comes up in your latest. Uh, uh, so it's um, novel in stories. Let, let's talk a little bit about that first. The Sleep of Apples has been described as a novel in stories. That sounds it's very much a Canadian uh, convention, isn't it? Uh, I think it's also in the States. Sometimes people will just call it a novel. And okay. I was really, I was really drawn to this form, reading books in this form. Uh, some of the books that I've loved are, uh, there's a writer born in Canada called David Zaloy, who lives in the UK, who is the Booker finalist. And his book, Turbulence, it's really mm. short book, uh, individual plane journeys. And all the characters are connected. And it's just, I, I think it's quite extraordinary. I reviewed it. And then a mentor of mine, uh, Joan Silber, often writes in this form, uh, her books, Improvement, Ideas of Heaven. Again, they sometimes just call it a novel, I guess, for commercial reasons. But right. it's really a different form because there isn't all the heavy backstory and sinews of connection. And I think the reader is more active. and People have told me with, with The Sleep of Apples, they get this kind of dopamine hit when they see the connections with the characters because mm. you're so much more active and it's it's a kind of exciting process. And it's a distilled book. You know, it's about a 200-page book rather than, say, a 400-page novel. Right. And you have nine uh, closely linked characters, obviously, all confronting issues such as mental illness morality, gender identity, et cetera. And I, I think when I think about the difference between a short story and a novel is the short story uh, is a lot harder in many ways because you have a limited amount of space to get something across, but you can take chances, right? You can have a, it doesn't have to be a, 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 a let's call it a typical story arc that you would have in a novel. You can, um mm -hmm. I guess you can experiment a little bit. Is that is that something that you were playing with with the with the nine different characters and, and their stories, like different ways that are some of them first person and others third person, that sort of thing? Yeah, definitely. And it kind of evolved as I went along. And I, you know, I, I really didn't want to write a sort of disparate grab bag of stories, you know, that are not really connected at all. Right. And in my in my first story collection, Blood Knots with Arsenal Pulp Press. The stories were linked thematically, but in this in this okay. collection, what kind of ties them together is the Montreal neighborhood of Saint Henri, which runs along the Lachine Canal, and they're a pretty diverse group of characters. So, if it weren't for this neighborhood, their lives probably wouldn't intersect. But it's it's a neighborhood that's really in flux, and you know, with the tension between old and new and affluent and struggling. And so that kind of unifies the characters. And the book, you know, you see some of the characters from birth all the way till they're much older. And in one story, the character will be telling the story. And in another character, you'll see that character from a different perspective. It's a, it's a really exciting form that I really enjoyed working in with this mm. book. I can imagine if you take one character, for example, and if one of the stories is told from their point of view, you you have not not necessarily an unreliable narrator, but you have a, a character that the whole story is through their perspective. So therefore, there may be elements that uh, they can't see, therefore the reader doesn't see, but the reader may pick up on those when they see the same character in someone else's story. That is it that sort of yeah. contextual layer? Yeah. Okay. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Does that give you and a you bit more freedom then in terms of, <laughs> of, of how you're going to play with this? Yeah, I think it's, it is a, a kind of a free form, but it's also, you were talking about how a story has real challenges and that's definitely true because it's so distilled and this form is very distilled. Right. So, you know, you have to also you know, compress something very deep, very important into a smaller space. Because it's a series of stories rather than a whole novel where you have more space to kind of spread out. <laughs> 
Okay. So you, and you've written both, right? You've written linked short stories yeah. or, or neighborhood connected stories as well as novels. Do you have a preference or does the, the project itself call for the, the, the format that you end up going with? I think the project calls for the format. I mean, I, I feel very much that I really am a novelist. I've, I'm working on a novel now and I'm definitely someone who likes to kind of have that expansiveness and working on a novel and reading a novel is kind of an enveloping experience. You always have something to work on. Some people say it's like a marriage. Some people say it's like a journey of a thousand miles, but <laughs> I kind of like that quality. A novel will take me, you know, five years to complete, not working constantly, but sort of finding the crux of the novel and doing, you know, countless numbers of revisions. So I guess I, you know, I'm a novelist and a short story writer, and I love both. So I, I wouldn't have to be able to say, you know, do, do I have a preference? But I think the material kind of dictates, like the title piece of The Sleep of Apples is actually a novella, which is, oh, okay. you know, its own form. And it comes last in the book. Okay, interesting. Now, when you were talking about Sleep of Apples and what ties these characters together, you, you said something that really intrigued me and it kind of led me back to previous things that we were just talking about. And you talked about the neighborhood. And when I think about Montreal, Canada's second largest, most populous city, and New York, um, very much they're parallel cities in terms, I think of them in, in the literary realm as very parallel to one another, um, maybe because yeah. of their the his, the historic, and you mentioned the Algonquin Hotel. What is it about cities like New York and Montreal, for example, that people can see of as this giant metropolis, but when you actually look into it, it's really an, an intriguing composite of very distinct neighborhoods where people are connected in a, in, a, in a very meaningful ways, unlike what you would maybe assume someone who's never lived in a large city. Yeah, I think that's definitely true of Montreal. And in Montreal, I was surprised moving here from the States about 25 years ago. But certain neighborhoods in Montreal are quite homogeneous, to be honest, you know, mm -hmm. and what I would drew me to San Henri is that it's not homogeneous. It's okay. very, very mixed. And and so is the neighborhood I, you know, live in, NDG. Um, but neighborhoods are really, and I think it's, it's true too of Toronto, I think as well, from mm -hmm. my times visiting there. Um, you know, I've loved some of the different neighborhoods that I discovered you know, the beaches and Queen Street area, and, you know, and, and I think it is true. And it makes the city, you know, gives the city a soul, I guess you could say. Yep. No, and that, that is true. Neighborhoods. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Toronto does have very distinctive neighborhoods that have a certain charm, a different kind of feel, a different, mm -hmm. well, different stories <laughs> that potentially would come out of those neighborhoods. Yeah, and that's kind of what made me like Toronto because people in Montreal love to diss Toronto. <laughs> so I don't know why. But it's a national a pastime for anyone not not it's, in Toronto. <laughs> it is. It really is. I don't like that. <laughs> and it's not just and it's not not just the the Maple Leafs versus the uh, the Habs. <laughs> it's 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 more right, it goes beyond right. hockey. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> so when you. When I look at uh, The Sleep of Apples, which came out of fall, uh, October 2021, yeah, it had such a claim from uh, 49th Shelf. Uh, it was on the fall's most anticipated. The Quill and Choir had it in the Best of Fall Guide. Canadian Living, it was in the 2021 Fall Book Club. CBC, Most Anticipated Fall Titles. Wow, what kind of marketing machine is behind this <laughs> behind this book? How did how did this happen that uh, it got into the well, hands of so many of the right people who basically called this out as a book that you have to check out this fall? You know, I was so grateful to get that visibility because I'm published with a small press and we had a tragedy where we lost our editor in chief, Luciana, almost, you know, just at this time last year suddenly wow so um you know it is my fifth book i think it's a really timely 
it's a very timely book because it deals with mortality and we're all been dealing with the COVID-19 right. pandemic. So, you know, impermanence and mortality is on our minds. I had a, a nice thing happen where in the summer issue of the Montreal Review of Books, which is a really nice tabloid devoted to our you know, literature here in Montreal, right. it got just a rave, rave, rave review. And I think what happens with publicity, it really does snowball. And one good thing leads to another. So you're, you're lucky uh, when that happens. I mean, I think the hardest thing for writers is just to be invisible. So, you know, it got into that, that early Montreal Review of Books before publication. Right. And I'm trying to think there were some other things. So, yeah, I feel really fortunate about that. And I, I think the themes are, are really timely. It also deals with gender identity. There's a non-binary character uh, called Collier, who's really central. And I think the themes and the subjects are, are really important right now and speak to people. Is this, is it important then to address and talk about gender identity, uh, mental illness, uh, subjects like that in fiction, as opposed to an essay? Now you talked about that with your, your debut novel as well. There was something that was really important that you wanted to share the sister and the support of the brother, et cetera, but it wasn't a biography. It wasn't, you know, a nonfiction essay. It was fictionalized. Why, how, and why would fictionalizing a topic make it maybe a bit, uh, a better format for, for this kind of discussion? You know, that's a great question. And I'm, for myself, I personally turn to fiction and to art, you know, poetry, uh, art in order to, as my avenue to the truth. And I, I think that what happens in fiction is kind of this magic is that you get, you know, you fall in love with the characters and you get really wrapped up in the story. And I, I like to have a lot of drama in my writing. It's mm -hmm. not just about language. I really like books where something is going to happen. Right. And so you get all wrapped up in that. And so, you know, the, the sort of themes are kind of snuck in there because you care about this character and you realize that they're struggling with mental illness and it will really increase your empathy much more than say reading some, you know, polemic or article about it. I think it's the most powerful form stories. Okay, cool. I uh, I like that. Has there been you've you've had definitely had no shortage of reviews of your latest novel, uh, or sorry, yeah, we'll call it a novel, <laughs> novel length short stories. But um, yeah, are there any reviews that um, maybe caught you by surprise, or maybe even they they commented on or picked up on something that wasn't a main focus, but they. They they drew something out of the, out of the character or out of the situation. Um, it hasn't happened so much with this book, but it has happened with other books where, you know, I've been a bit nonplussed by some of the reviews, and you know, people are going to take different things from a book. I guess the thing that upsets me the most is if there's a review that gets some facts wrong about the book oh. or that they kind of misinterpret certain things. Right. But with this book, I think people are pretty much connecting and, and, and on the same page that I am. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I love the fact that, you know, it's like falling in love. People are going to get different things out of my book. They're going to bring themselves to it. What what I have noticed is that like I had one have one story in the book called Aurora. It's one of the stories that has not was not published in a literary magazine. And I was so touched that the reviewer in the MRB, that was, you know, her favorite story. So sometimes you'll think, oh, well, maybe this is not my best and that it'll be somebody's favorite. So people have really different responses. To their favorite story or what they get out of it. And I, I love that. I think that's a great thing. 
Yeah, that's always uh, exciting when you can reappreciate something you spent so much time with through, you know, someone else's completely uh, unique perspective. For sure. So you also have led uh, workshops for adults, for teens, uh, for seniors even, uh, and, and mm-hmm. you have taught writing to formerly incarcerated women. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, you know, what, what you get out of uh, leading those kinds of workshops for folks? Yeah, well, I really love leading workshops. The workshop for formerly incarcerated women was in the United States in New Jersey and they lived in a halfway house and I would go there and work on writing and it was a really things together which is such a cool idea <laughs> and originally it was supposed to I was supposed to go to these areas like Gaspé Z or up north right and because of COVID it had to be on Zoom so it was a bit of a different experience but it still you know was was a lot of you know doing workshops is quite an intimate thing because people are really putting themselves out there on the page. But it's quite, quite fulfilling to see people develop and to find one of the big tasks is, you know, really finding one's material. What What's the material that's really going to, you know, explode and, and be powerful for you? And I think that's a process that, you know, we all go through as writers. How do we find our material? You, know, you might start writing something and it just feels dead. And then you re- start writing something else. And it's, it's just incredible. So that's something that I work on a lot with people, you know, kind of tapping into what is their material, their stories to tell. Oh, that is wonderful. Um, I love that. It, I mean, it also uh, maybe even makes the process of writing uh, a lot more approachable. When, when you're starting off from mm-hmm. something that's so personal to them, they have stories that are worth telling and, and you're helping them find ways to share those. Yeah, for sure. I mean, with the, with the class, um, well, both the class to formerly incarcerated women and the class storyscaping, I do a lot of um, kind of exercises and springboards that really get people going without feeling too tense about it uh, because they're just free writing. So they don't have to worry that it's perfect or it's finished. And then we share those, you know, some of them are to work on characters. Some of them are to work on voice. When I do these in person, a lot of times I, I cut out a lot of really evocative, you know, photos or pictures of either people or landscapes and, and, the participants will pick one and then they'll just create a whole story around that. So it gives a little bit of a framework for people to get started. Okay. I like that. When you're, when you're helping teach other writers uh, like this, or I, I call them younger writers, even if they may be seniors, et cetera, because it, uh, they're new to writing. Are there, mm-hmm. are there things that remind you of, of, of stuff that you wish you knew when you were starting? Or is that something you're able to go back and see at this point? Yeah, like I said earlier, you know, I, I had a lot of trouble revising at first. I just sort of didn't know how to do it. Right. And but I think writing is writing is something that you really learn by doing and by reading. Okay. You know, those two things. Um not by rules so much. It's really a, you know, when you when you're sitting down to write a story or a novel, you you you, you start with a voice and maybe that voice will really take off. Or maybe you'll find that you know, you start writing in the third person and it's too too distant and then you have to change it. There's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of, you know, seeing what's going to work best. So it's really a, a practice that you have to learn by doing. Excellent. Is it, um, when you're doing writing, do you find, do people more naturally uh, migrate to, you know, short fiction or to essays or more articles or what do you, or is it, is it, is it going across the board? Well, I mostly teach short fiction. I think it's really hard to teach the novel without kind of seeing a whole draft. It's just, right. it's, it's hard to do in a workshop. Yeah. And I've also worked with some people on memoir, sort of one-on-one in a program, you know, mentoring program. Um, but mostly in workshops, I like to, to teach the short story because you could look at the whole thing and people mm-hmm. can complete complete a story. 
A, a novel is kind of complex to teach in a workshop because you're only going to see a part of what people are doing. Right. And you're not going to see the whole trajectory of the book. Okay. That's interesting. Now, you had mentioned that you are working on uh, the next project. Is it mm -hmm. a novel? Is it linked stories? What's the format that it's taking? It's definitely a novel. It's called Treasures That Prevail, which is, I usually get a lot of my titles from little excerpts from poems. And so mm -hmm. it's from, it's a line from an Adrian Rich poem called Diving Into the Wreck, a very famous mm -hmm. poem. Yeah. And I'm almost through a first draft. I've, you know, taken a bit of time out to uh, get the word out on this book, but um, I'm hoping I'll finish finish a draft you know within the next couple of months and then begin the big revision process <laughs> so it's definitely a novel <laughs> is there anything that you tend to use as a palate cleanser between writing projects hmm. well maybe taking some time to read and just lay fallow and I, I don't really i don't suffer from being blocked as a writer but um I think when you finish something, you know, I don't immediately start something new, um, okay. but publishing is a slow business. So when your book is published, you know, maybe it's been finished for a while. Right. Right. Of course. Books aren't, aren't published immediately. So. Yeah. Usually that's I'm often uh, kind of... <laughs> you're, you're asked questions in the media <laughs> about a book that you finished working on two years ago. <laughs> yeah. No, fair so. enough. So as we get closer to the end, uh, I'm wondering if you have any advice that you would give to beginning writers who are looking at what you've done mm -hmm. and wondering, okay, what what like what are some of the some of the tips or bits of advice that you you would offer to a beginning writer who is looking at the daunting task of finishing their first story or finishing their first novel for that matter? Well, the best advice that I could give a young writer, I think one of the most intimidating things is to sit down, get your bum in the chair and do the work. So what I recommend to people is to write in your phone or in your appointment book, whatever you use for your commitments and carve out a certain amount of time during your week. I don't know what people may be in school or have a job or whatever they're doing, but carve out blocks of time during the week where you are committed to sitting down and working on your project, working on your writing, whatever it is, taking notes, drafting, and stick to it. Because if you don't sit down, the, the books, the stories, they're never going to get written. So that is the most important advice that I have is to, you know, mark it in as you would your doctor's appointment or your class or whatever you're doing and 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 give yourself that gift of I mean people feel very intimidated like why do I have the right to sit down they get nervous but just if it's in if it's committed in your book and you sit down and do it you'll find that more and more you'll get more and more momentum and more and more inspiration and more and more confidence that is fantastic. Thank you. And a great way to wrap up with some wonderful advice for writers. Amy, can you please let my listeners know where they can find out more about you, your books, your, your yourself, etc.? Sure thing. Well, I think if you go on my website, which is just my name.com, amysansbrodoff.com, Amy with an I, sands like sands on the beach. There's a lot of information about each of my books and you know events and press and that's a good place to start <laughs> awesome any any uh forthcoming events in the next few months that you're looking forward to yeah well i just found out today that i'm going to be going to vancouver they have a jewish book festival so i'm super excited i'm going to be doing a couple of events there as a featured author and i'm thrilled to to do the events and also to visit Vancouver. And I have some friends there, so I'm super excited to have a trip. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> and to participate in the festival. So that's the next thing that's coming up. And now I'll have a little bit of a 
nice break over the holidays. So I'm looking forward to reading, writing, rest, and relaxation. <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. A little bit of a palate cleanser there. And uh, please send me the link to that uh, where you're a featured author, and we'll include that in the show notes at starkreflections.ca. Oh, for sure. I will do. And Amy, thank you so much for spending the time with me, uh, hanging out with me again today. And thank you, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. One of the things I wanted to reflect on in relation to Amy's interview was uh, when she talked about how publicity can snowball. Now, it's a subtle thing, and it happens in social media. It actually happens in, in, in when things go viral, and, and, and it's just it's this amazing thing that can happen. And I know you can't control it, what happens and how things are going to move. But what you can control is what I'll get to in a second, is you can plant a heck of a lot of lightning rods. And I'll get back to that analogy because I've had um, on TikTok, as an example, I've been playing around on TikTok, posting things. I can put all kinds of energy into creating videos. And ironically, it's the random videos that suddenly make it. And in, in the way that this is, and it's kind of not frustrating, but... I had a viral video around October. I was uh, laughing in front of a tombstone, and uh, it was it was just kind of it was like a mocking uh, mocking uh, thing with um, a meme audio clip that was it's a good joke, it's a great joke, but you're gonna have to stop. That was it, and it was just me lip syncing to that in front of a, a green screen uh, image. And that's had, what, 130,000 views or some craziness. Uh, for me, that's a lot. For, you know, for actual viral authors um, on TikTok or anyone on TikTok who's very viral, that's nothing. <laughs> but to me, it's huge because my average video gets 150 views, 200 views. Then the other one, uh, I, I've been doing a series, of what I call a hashtag morning coffee reflections. And it's really just me sitting there with my morning coffee at my computer and I tell a stupid dad joke. And I did one which was a joke with a horse that goes into a bar and it, it involves Descartes. So it's got a bit of philosophy. So it's a little bit longer and it's sort of a two-tiered, multi-layered joke. And I think I'm close to 30,000 views. And again, nothing viral, but it's kind of funny that the, the ones that are already popular get the popularity. It's like the book on the bestseller list is the one that gets featured in the front window. It doesn't need to be featured in the front window because it's already on the bestseller list. Everyone knows about it. And so it's that same sort of frustration with uh, with the viral videos. It's like, no, no, no. But I did this other video that's really cute and I did this neat thing and I think it's funny. You should watch that one that it only has 100 views. So it's, it's kind of funny how those things can snowball. But we got to roll with it and we got to take it where we can. And so I know that the video that I that I posted, you know, proudly showing off my display copy of Fright Night's Big City, the new novel, no one's going to barely see it. But potentially because of my Descartes dad joke and potentially because of my previous um, uh, October Halloween joke, that potentially that's going to um, lead someone to go, oh, he's a writer too. And, and that could lead to good things. But I'll take it. I will take it. And and so Amy talks about that. So she had this review uh, in a Montreal magazine and that focuses on uh, you know local literary uh, talents. And that led to amazing other opportunities. Canadian Housekeeping. I think it's a major magazine. And all of these other things that were really great reviews for her latest book. And that's fantastic. I know she works with a publicist uh, as well. And, and and again, the publicist will put out feelers and try 30, 40 things and maybe five of them will, will work. And maybe one of them will actually be something that leads to the next thing. And that's what we do. That's what Amy does. That's what I do. That's what authors do. And so the, I'm going to go back to the lightning rod. Um, and this is almost uh, so a good friend of mine, Kevin J. Anderson, uh, international <laughs> best-selling science fiction author, if you've watched the new Dune movie, well, guess what? Kevin's uh, in the credits for that because Kevin uh, is a good friends of Frank Herbert's son, Brian, and Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson have been co-authoring novels in the Dune universe for 30 years. Now, there's a lot of really awesome things happening with Kevin and Hollywood and his writing career. 
but that's after 30 years of work and it's after what I would say Kevin J. Anderson planting a heck of a lot of lightning rods because he's not sure where the lightning is going to strike but he plants a ton of them and he has for decades he's one of the hardest working writers I know with all of the books that he's constantly working on and writing and putting out he does he embraces traditional publishing he embraces self-publishing but he'll plant a dozen lightning rods this month one of them may strike and it may not strike right away it may strike 10 years later but he continues to plant those lightning rods and that's the same thing with the publicity that worked for amy when uh this book was still on pre-order uh, you know the early versions that were sent out as review copies someone picked it up someone loved it someone else saw it it led to that i got onto tv because i was in a local um i was in a local circular that was circulated in the neighborhood got into that circular got into the daily paper um, for the city and then that's when i got invited to be on a morning program that was broadcast to pretty much three quarters of the province of ontario which isn't isn't bad <laughs> pretty good thing but it was all because of planting a lot of those lightning rods and that's the thing about publicity that's the thing with social media right you continue to put your work out on tiktok or you need to tweet some things or put up interesting content on instagram or wherever it is that you're sharing it and every once in a while one of those lightning rods gets struck and that's what leads to it and that's what amy was talking about so yeah we're gonna fail a lot of the times and most of the stuff we put out there is is gonna the resounding sound of crickets <laughs> is all we're going to hear but we continue to put those lightning rods out we continue to work at it we continue to get up as i mentioned in the early earlier reflection uh, early uh, before the interview it's that success the difference between success and failure is getting up one more time that's why you're doing it right it's why you're writing it you believe you want to do this. Amy talked about that. Is this something I want to do with my life? Yes, this is definitely something she gets intrinsic value from. So some of the things are going to be hugely successful. Other things, not so much. She's going to keep at it. What is it that's going to drive you forward as an author? What are those things that are going to allow you to continue to plant those lightning rods so that they can turn into snowballs? Yes, I'm going to, I'm going to mix metaphors left, right, and center. I can do that. It's my podcast. <laughs> well, that's it for uh, this reflection. And that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. If you enjoy the podcast, one of the things you can do to help me out is you can leave a review on wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also share it with a friend that you think would find value in listening to these stark reflections on writing and publishing. So until next week, and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com. You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. But you have heard of me.